Here we are. All right. So whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you. I am excited to be here today with all of you and to present with my colleagues on our topic um, that you can see is called The Answer is in the Syllabus, Improving Syllabi to be Student-Centered in inclusive and effective. I, my name is Jennifer Gruy, and I'm here with my colleagues, Marlene Graff, Rose Judd Murray, Meredith Wang, um, Sarah Tulane, Lauren Hunt, and Rachel Robison. And we each come from seven very different content area expertise in departments across our campus. Despite coming from very different content areas, we've been able to interact and collaborate with each other and other faculty in a course that's been going on since this fall and will continue on through the entire academic year. It's a 25 week course on effective online teaching practices. Um, it's a course that's endorsed by the Association of College and University Educators. As part of our course, we had the opportunity to, to dig in some depth and detail regarding the syllabi that we use in our courses. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. One point that became apparent early on in this whole process of looking at our syllabi was that often students' perceptions of the usefulness of the syllabus um, often do not match or align well with instructors' perceptions of the syllabus. This can be problematic since the syllabus is often a critical component of student success within a course. And some students may feel a sense of disconnect, confusion, feeling overwhelmed or intimidated by traditional syllabus. It can become important for each of us as teachers to communicate important information and be able to use the syllabus as a tool for students in supporting their success as well as maintaining a document that is also well received by the students in our respective courses. So as a group, we were able to identify and um, essential, and let me actually, here's our, here's our, <laughs> our bios um, and our contact information. We were able to identify the essential information um, for our syllabus and articulate it. Um, in that process, we decided that the, what we need to have in our syllabus is the goals of the course, the students' responsibilities within that course, and the evaluation criteria, and for those elements to be presented and communicated clearly with students, all the while maintaining space in the syllabus that is very student-centered and inclusive. With that goal in mind, um, we engaged with each other in a peer review process as part of our AQ course. We provided our syllabus and got the opportunity to both give and receive feedback. This helped each of us to identify examples within our own syllabus, as well as examples within other instructors' syllabi where we were successfully meeting these goals. It also provided to be a, it proved to be a valuable experience in receiving feedback and ideas on ways to improve our own syllabus. I now I'm going to show you a, a video clip that introduces some of the key concepts and elements to um, looking and and strategies for reviewing one's own syllabus, as well as give you it has an example of the type of information that we learn and are learning in our AQ course. Um, then you'll hear from my colleagues as they share their own specific examples of these ideas. Welcome to the AQ module on preparing an effective syllabus. In this module, we'll discuss how to communicate essential information. A good course syllabus will identify the basic logistics of a course, the days of the week that the course will meet, the times, the number of credit hours. I found that a checklist is very beneficial in creating a syllabus because it ensures that I am covering the most fundamental aspects of the course. And facilitate student success. A good syllabus can be and should be a roadmap for your objectives and where you're going to go and what you need to be focusing in on. Now to me the purpose of a syllabus is to convey the purpose of the class. 
It's about really getting down to the essence of what is this class about. Instead of just being like a bunch of content that we need to cover, I want it to be something meaningful to you. Ultimately, when I'm crafting a syllabus, I'm sort of thinking about all these different pieces that go into being a problem solver or being a critical thinker or being creative. And then I try to create activities that allow them to practice those things. Let's begin. about diversity and inclusion came up in several ways in the ACU course. We all know from our experiences teaching that our students come from diverse backgrounds and sets of experiences and that those sets of experience and backgrounds make for a fantastic learning environment. That said, students from some backgrounds may have more challenges uh, or with navigating or feeling comfortable with the course than others. So one important set of lessons that I've learned from the ACU course is how to set up an inclusive student environment in the classroom, or at least how to get better at doing that. And I've also gotten better at um, getting my syllabus to reflect that so that when students come in on that first day of class, they feel comfortable approaching me, they feel welcome in the course. So I'll just share with you a few brief lessons that I've learned about this topic. Uh, so first, it's helpful to use student-friendly language. We should keep in mind that some of our students might be first generation students and a, a college environment might not be very familiar to them. The language of a syllabus can be intimidating to students. It can read like a contract and it might prevent students from reaching out for help when they need it. So policies obviously need to be clearly articulated on the syllabus, but we can include language that's learning centered uh, so that it's, it's there to help the students grow and makes clear that at, we as teachers want to help students prevent problems from happening in the first place, rather than simply docking them points or punishing them when, the, when those problems arise. So let me give you an example. Consider a plagiarism policy. Um, plagiarism policies might be a little scary to students. It's not always the case that they have a clear understanding of what plagiarism is. So um, you might want to have something on this on the syllabus of encouraging them to come and talk to you before resorting to plagiarism. You might be to steer them in the right direction, provide them from, with some um, advice or information about what counts as plagiarism, or you might be able to provide them with some kind of accommodation. And so this this creates a welcome environment where students feel supported and and um, and comfortable. Second. You might consider providing links and directions for accessing useful resources. So um, in, in doing so, you'll want to be mindful about diverse interests and needs. So for example, if your school has a food pantry, you could include information about where to find it. You could include information about where to find mental health support, diversity centers and organizations and things like that that will make the student feel more comfortable both in your class and on campus. Third, it's important to include a diverse range of thinkers in your set of course readings and materials if, if doing so is possible, which I think it is most of the time. I teach philosophy, which has famously had a problem with diversity and inclusion in the past. So in the past year, I've really been thinking about that and I've restructured my classes so that they more appropriately reflect, far from perfect, I'm sure, but the contributions of women and minorities the, the contributions that those thinkers have made to the history of ideas and to ongoing conversations. And students know this right from the get-go, that, that there's an attempt being made to do this. Uh, they know from reading the syllabus that we'll be reading a diverse um, group of thinkers. So one thing that I've done in response to taking the ACU course is I've adopted a big ideas approach to structuring my syllabus. So before, uh, before I took the, the ACU course, in my course outline, I just had what you typically see in a course outline. So readings for each class and any assignments that might be due that week or whatever. So um, now I I've come to think about each week in the course as a different conversation. And this, is, this can be um, particularly useful in an online class where you might be thinking about your course materials in terms of weeks instead of in terms of individual days. Um, so I've adopted this big ideas approach. And um, so in, in, when I'm looking at the course materials for the week in the little section dedicated for that week, um, I think about each week as a different conversation. And I say in a few sentences what the big ideas involved in that conversation will be and who the participants are. 
Including a diverse set of voices not only provides a more accurate picture of the history of ideas, but it also makes diverse populations feel more welcome, more represented, represented, and I think importantly, puts themselves in a position to see themselves doing what these thinkers are doing, kind of imagine possibilities for themselves. When we keep in mind that students come from diverse backgrounds, we design our courses in, in different ways. We create an environment in which students feel that they're in a good position to succeed. So one thing that we've learned about building student-centered syllabi is that it's really great to be clear and as transparent as you can be with course deadlines and policies, because this is something that can improve student motivation as well as success in the course. Plus there is potential to help with student engagement in the course. One thing that was suggested is that you set up a pattern or a predictable routine for expectations for engagement and assignment deadlines in the course. This can really help students know where they're going. And speaking of where students are going, one of my favorite ways to use my syllabus is as a type of map. So when I'm doing my weekly announcements, I'll pull up some of the visual elements from my syllabus and point out the things that we're doing so students can actually see where we are. They can see the patterns of expectation for their engagement, as well as the expectation for assignment due dates. One student-centered item regarding deadlines to include in a syllabus is a clearly articulated late policy. So how you will be handling late work and late submissions in your course. One thing to consider is perhaps including a point or a percentage deduction for the timeline of late submissions, what you're willing to accept. This can potentially deter students from submitting late work, but it also gives them that buffer zone or that safety net for when life happens and they do happen to miss a deadline. Now the late policy in my class, I try to be as clear as I can in the syllabus. In my syllabus review video, I give them an example of how it works. And even in the syllabus quiz, there are questions about the late work policy. Um, but again, I really like the idea of a syllabus being a map used in the course. And so I try and remind them of that policy as we go throughout the course. I recognize students are taking multiple courses with multiple policies and so as I utilize my syllabus as a map, it helps them to have clarity in navigating the course. Your syllabus is an important spot to include your grading policies, and ultimately those should be aligning with your teaching philosophy. Being consistent and transparent about grading is something that can increase student motivation as well as decrease student stress. And giving specifics in the syllabus is a great place to start. In our ACU training, they covered three different things to consider when building your syllabus and, and providing clarity in this realm of grading policy. First, it's suggested to explain your grading system in the syllabus, as well as in class, even if you're teaching online. Next, make sure the values assigned to the tasks in the course reflect the relative importance of that task or that assignment. And finally, establish clear grading policies and procedures. These are things you would include in your syllabus. Now, they gave us a lot of examples of how you can make student-centered grading policies and procedures, just depending on what you're teaching or the content you have from extra credit to weighting assignments to point systems for your grading. One thing that I use in my class that was also talked about in our ACU training was the option for revision after feedback. I teach your research methods class, and if you think about actually publishing, sometimes the feedback you receive is to revise and resubmit. So in my class, I offer the opportunity for a revision and resubmission. I love the idea of my students applying what they have learned, and if they happen to miss the mark, that they have an opportunity um, to demonstrate refinement and mastery for just a few points back to their grades. This is another clip from our AQ course that talks about the advantages of using a graphic syllabus. The advantages of a graphic syllabus, especially for students, is that they get an overall big picture of the field, big picture of the subfield, big picture of the course. They, their minds photograph it, so they have a general idea of the shape, the flow of what you have in mind. Students think the world of these things. They follow it like a map. 
I, I use them. Students keep pulling it out during the semester. They keep looking at it to see where we are and to see, check those interrelationships among the concepts. Hi, I'm going to talk about why visualizations are very important in the syllabus. The top three reasons why I like visualizations are listed here. I find that oftentimes when I try to explain the organization or the structure of my class in the long paragraph, students won't get it or they won't remember it. It's so much easier to do that with a few simple chart or uh, some tables. Let me show you some examples. I included four examples here. Two are from my own class, two are the visualizations I did for my colleagues during peer review process. The large table you see here is the course calendar for my own class. You can see the whole semester in one table. My students can easily find their weekly readings, the weekly assignment. They can see the workload is evenly distributed across the semester and the assignments are color coded based on the type and deadlines as well. They usually find it very, very helpful because they can keep this one table instead of keep reading the long syllabus to understand my class. And it's easier to keep track of uh, the progress. The second table here uh, is to show students how I align assignments with my objectives, uh, which assignments serve which purpose and how many points that's worth. The other two colorful charts I created for my colleagues are both about assessment and uh, your assignments, how much it's, each assignment is worth. You can choose your own color, your own shape. Uh, you can easily do this in PowerPoint. There are so many built-in charts you can customize, the color, the font, the size. And when you offer multiple options for students, let's say 10 quizzes and you take eight or a discussion post and you take six, sometimes it can be very confusing how to keep track of with long paragraphs. With one simple table, they can keep track of their own progress. I hope you find this helpful. If you need more information, please contact me. I'm Lauren Hunt, and I'm going to be talking about presenting the syllabus to your students and using activities for them to engage with the syllabus. Students often don't engage with the syllabus because it's just a long document and it's not engaging for them to read it. And if we read it aloud to them in class, they don't pay attention or they miss some of the important points and don't see it as a resource once they go back home. So the solution is to engage students with syllabus activities early in the semester when you first present them with the document. And there's a couple different kinds of syllabus engagement activities that we can use with our students. One of the most straightforward of these is a syllabus quiz. Um, this, is, this is something that I've done in the past, and I think it's a great way to have students um, really start to hunt for answers and use the syllabus as that resource that we hope it is for them. On the syllabus quiz, make sure you ask questions about the elements that are most important for them to know. So think about what they need to know, for example, attendance policies, deadlines, due dates, things like that. Make sure you ask about those things in the syllabus quiz. And there's actually some features on most learning management systems um, that allow you to use this quiz as a gateway for the rest of the course. So you can make it um, so the rest of the modules open once they take the quiz or even keep the rest of the course locked until they get a certain score like 100%. Um, the challenge of this method of engagement with the syllabus is that it's just another homework assignment for the students to complete. If you have a, um, a heavy workload in your course, this could be seen as busy work by some students. But the pro of this method is students are individually accountable for understanding your course's policies and procedures. So there's no chance that if they got 100% on the syllabus quiz, they would not have encountered some of your policies in the past that will then come into play later in the semester for them. There's a couple other types of activities you could use that are um, less obvious, perhaps. One of those is scavenger hunts. So this is similar to the quiz in that you're gonna come up with a list of questions that you think it's important for all the students to know. Then in class time, you'll divide students into small groups or pairs, and then the students will search for the answers to the questions in the syllabus. After that, you'll review the answers with the whole class to make sure everyone understands and got the right answers. You could make this into a competition by providing a prize to the first group of students that answers all the questions correctly. 
Another version of this where you're not providing the list of questions would be the syllabus reconnaissance. In this, students will put a star or mark five important facts or takeaways from reading the syllabus. Then in groups, they compare which elements they marked as important. Um, each group shares their finding with the class and you make a whole class list of what's important. And then you as the instructor can go through and uh, note anything that the students didn't seem, think was important, but you do think is important. Another type of activity you could do with the syllabus would be a jigsaw activity. To do this, you'll divide your syllabus into a few different sections. Then you'll put your students into groups and each group is responsible to learn about their one assigned section of the syllabus and become an expert on it. Then you reform groups to be comprised of one student from each original group. Then in each group, they teach each other about their assigned section. You can, if you wanna give them participation points or something like that for doing this activity in class, you could have a worksheet for them to fill out or something like that, or you could just teach, take it as a peer teaching opportunity. I've seen the value of student syllabus interactions in my courses. Uh, students will have fewer questions and complaints because they actually had to read the syllabus and engage with the material rather than me just telling them things where it goes in one ear and out the other. Students also know what information is present in the syllabus, so when they do have questions, they might be more inclined to look there for answers instead of going directly to the faculty member. Finally, if you made them pass a test and they got the question right, they can't deny that they know that information if they answered the question correctly, which saves a lot of headache later on with students complaining about things. Finally, I think it, it presents your course as an active and engaged place for learning from the first day of your class. And this is why I'm in the future always going to have some kind of student syllabus activity in my courses. The AQ course that the seven of us are enrolled in, we were randomly assigned to peer review groups that consisted of three people. And so this happened after we had all been through the module on how to create a syllabus that was more student friendly and engaging. And so we'd all had some exposure to that content. So this process of peer review was actually really helpful. It's not something I've ever done before. And that's kind of surprising because I think we're all familiar with the peer review process with research and publications. And yet it never occurred to me to have a peer or colleague also evaluate my syllabi before I shared that with students. And so um, for our assignment, each of us provided a copy of a syllabus from one of our courses. And then the other two members of our group evaluated that and offered some feedback. Each of us came up with two or three questions that we wanted them to focus on or really look at. And, and then we did the same for them. And for me, I felt like this was a really beneficial activity because it helped me see some things in my syllabus that I hadn't really noticed before. And also it was helpful for me to see examples of other syllabi from other courses and um, see what I could implement into my syllabus to make it a little more clear and student friendly. So this is definitely something that I recommend and something that I hope to continue in the future. I think, however, that it will be more useful for me to ask colleagues that I already know and trust someone who knows something about my class rather than just asking someone at random. But that was what worked for us. Let's see, Rose, I think this is your section. Yeah, I didn't, I just saw you on the camera and so I didn't oh, want sorry. To, I got real nervous. I'm not sure if everyone can see me, but um, I, this thought was one that we took, well, Marlene actually brought this quote to our attention because she was digging into Dr. Lang's book before any of us were ahead of the ball game. But this is from his book, Distracted, Why Students Can't Focus on What You Can Do About It. And we thought this would be a powerful way to kind of conclude this session and kind of bring this all together. Presenting students with an effective uh, syllabus written in a friendly, approachable way influence the perceptions 
of the instructor and the course. And what we know from research is that those first impressions with students matter. And I know that if you listen to the keynote, he talked about a warm uh, interactions and cold interactions. And by developing that warm interaction from the get go, it develops a relationship. It's the beginning of the relationship. It's the beginning of the trust. It's the beginning of the understanding that a, an instructor is invested in student development. So creating the syllabus for the course is not an afterthought. It actually establishes the baseline for where students begin their interactions uh, with you. And take, taking into consideration the, the attention to the tone and the way that you structure your, your graphics, your assignments, how you weight things, do you have solid learning outcomes? Those things all facilitate everything that's going to happen down throughout the rest of the semester. So I think it's a powerful way to establish that you are, I am here, I am prepared, I'm ready to teach, and you are the priority. By the way that I talk to you in inclusion, the way that I approach how we are different and how we are the same, how I approach uh, the assignments that we are going to take on, the way that we're going to, uh, the seriousness with the way that I take the, that I want you to take to the syllabus. It's because this thing matters and our content's gonna matter. So there are points to this where I think the syllabus it, it approaches that warmness, right? We wanna have that warmness. We want to let the students know, I'm not distracted. I'm here, I'm ready to go. I've invested in you from the very beginning. Um, will you switch to the next slide? Just really quick, Jen. We are like down to the last 30 seconds here. We wanted to make sure that you walk away with deliverables. Okay, so I've included the tiny URL here, T4L Improving Syllabi. It's going to have all the references, um, more examples, specifically some, uh, I believe it was Lauren and Meredith included a lot of their graphic examples. And also we included the syllabus checklist um, from USU, from our Center for Innovative, uh, I'm going to butcher it, design, oh, who, Samantha, you tell them what city Center stands for. Center for Innovative for. Design and Instruction. <laughs> Travis, I'm so embarrassed you had to answer that for me, but thank you. Okay, uh, we're here. Our emails are all included in this. We're happy to answer questions and reach out to you. I appreciate the interaction that we've gotten through the chat through this session. Uh, thank you so much. This was a great course. If any of you ever get an opportunity to take a class from AQ at your institution, uh, we're just going to give a shameless plug there because it, it's been it's been a real game changer for all of us. So from all seven of us, we thank you for attending the session and wish you the best for the rest of the semester. All right. Well, you, we actually have about seven minutes, oh. You're, <laughs> My time which is, is even off. better for questions. Yeah, right? let's do it. That was intentional. <laughs> So um, with those seven minutes, I wonder if anyone has um, some questions that they'd like to, we should be ending at 1.45, so we've got a few minutes left. Either in the chat or if you wanna raise your hand or just unmute yourself and ask away. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen so I can see the chat. Oh, good. Thank you so much for uh, presentation. I haven't, um, I, I just saw that Scott, what is students collaboration for teaching. Uh, I really love that. So I haven't used it before, but can you share your own experience? Uh, I mean, uh, with us or with me, please. Sorry, and that was not my intention to steal your all, your all, your theme. So I'll just, it's just, I know that BYU and UVU also have these. Um, so at your individual institutions, you might look into your centers for teaching and learning, um, but these are opportunities for students to go in and look through syllabus or look at classes. So I really uh -huh. appreciate the panelists bringing this other side of peer review, which is um, amongst our colleagues, right? And having colleagues also do that work. So I think there could be some really useful kind of triangulation to use that word, right? Of, what is everyone, how are people reacting to this document? So. Yeah.
Yeah, I Mehmet, I that's the first time I've heard that they had a student version of that as well. But I think what was really fascinating about our peer reviews was <laughs> the comments that came back, you know, even just in the side note, you know, you might want to consider clarifying this. Things that I thought were so clear. <laughs> and when a when a peer comes back and says, you know, how does this connect to this learning objective? Or you may want to look at um, I had built a graphic illustration of all of my learning outcomes, how they were connected to the assignments, and then how those assignments were connected to the exams. And in my mind, it made perfect sense. And I had a colleague say to me, the way it's put on this line, it feels like it's separate from this bullet point. And as immediately when they said that, I was like, oh my gosh, they're so right. And I think that's what the kind of feedback that we need. It's not really that something is really wrong or something's huge parts are missing. It was just that clarification. And so I can see a lot of value in even obtaining student feedback as well as peer root, peer feedback on our, on our syllabus. And the other thing that I'll just say is um, it's a great connector if you're on a PNT track to be able to say that I'm serious enough in my, you know, my teaching effectiveness or however it's written in your in your role statement, I'm serious enough about my teaching that I'm having my syllabi reviewed um, on the regular. That that does show a commitment to teaching excellence and teaching performance. So Well, Rose, you kind of touched on this. There's a question in the chat about what kind of changes did you all make to your syllabus? What were some of those things you noticed? Um, so, so I was going to say one thing um, that was interesting to me was that my colleagues actually pointed out things that they liked about my syllabus, <laughs> which I didn't realize uh, there were some unique elements of it. I had some of that language in my plagiarism um, statement that was a little bit more student friendly. Hey, come talk to me if you're really stressed out and overwhelmed. I want to help you before you resort to academic dishonesty. Um, and that was that was really interesting. And and it was really nice to see some um, ways in which uh, for I'll give the example of Meredith. Meredith has one of the most organized, <laughs> clean, easy to follow schedules. I know everybody's gonna be emailing Meredith after this, but um, that I have ever seen. And just getting some examples of like, oh, I had never thought of it, of, of doing it quite that way. And having my calendar be as organized as um, Meredith's was, was a, some, some of those kind of little nuggets here and there were just great ideas that I'm, um, I've incorporated in my own. Um, one thing that I changed on mine, Rose actually reviewed mine, um, and she had pointed out one line that I had just underneath my percentage breakdown for grades, and she asked um, why it was I had included that, what my reasons were behind it, and I honestly don't remember why I had put it in there. It's been in my it's been in my syllabi for so long that it's it's just something that was part of it, and I actually had to stop and think, oh, why am I including this? Is there a reason? Is is it benefiting students? And so that was really helpful to me to have someone just glance over and say, oh, what's your reasoning behind this particular idea? And really give thought to that. Great. Thanks, everyone, for sharing. I think you pointed out to how useful peer review can be, not only for getting us reviewed, but the process of thinking, looking through other people's syllabi and, and reflecting on our own, what, our own documents, right? Um, so in the chat, I've pasted two links. The first one is to the Mighty Links, I mean, the Mighty Networks app, um, where we could continue this conversation. I'm hoping I didn't see it there already. Maybe you all could paste um, that tiny URL into in there so that we could kind of follow up um, if that seems like something you'd be willing to do. And then if folks had any more questions, we could direct. Um, we can continue this conversation there. So that's the first link. The second link is. Um, a feedback form on how our sessions are going. Um, so with that, we give a lot of thanks to all of our presenters today. One second. Rose, 
Shaylin, I can see there's a couple of questions we didn't get to. So we'll go to Mighty Networks. I'll post paste those directly from this. And then if our presenters from this session, if they could chime in on the Mighty Networks and help us answer some of these we didn't get to, that'd be great. Thanks, Rose. That's a great idea. Um, so we'll see everyone there or in the next sessions. And thanks again. And have a nice rest of the conference.